Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 644. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. Today's February 9, 2021. All right, welcome to another program of Anglican Unscripted, where two guys over 50 sit down and talk about the Anglican news, the Christian news that's going on around the globe, and today will be no different. But before we get too far into the show, please like these episodes on Facebook and YouTube. It's free advertising for us. Share these with your friends or foes. We're not picky about who you share it with at all. And please go to the comment sections. In the comment section, the show continues. Uh, we're getting 50 to 100 comments per episode. We really appreciate that. We read each comment and we respond where appropriate. But we let you guys continue the show there. If you have not subscribed to Anglican Scripted, now's your chance. You go to YouTube, you click on that little, that's not yellow, little red rectangle, and it turns into a bell. If you click the bell, you are supposed to get instant notifications that a new episode has been uploaded by Kevin with his mouse. So, beyond that, how are you doing, George? I'm doing great. I survived our annual parish meeting on Sunday. <laughs> we did it by Zoom, and elected a vestry, uh, presented the budget. It's a deficit budget. It's the first deficit budget I've presented in this church in seven years. Mm. And our spending is back at 2017 levels. But that, And that's based on no... Uh, building uh, no income uh, other than what people pledge right no, no plate no, no plate no plates no plate income no rental income no group income now we're hoping that this pandemic will end uh and we can uh re redo our uh, budget for the future but i for one am a i don't like debt uh as a young man <laughs> i had trouble with credit cards uh, it's one of these kids where you, I went to college mm -hmm. and they gave me a free t-shirt and a credit card and I was hooked for about 10 years until I, I same here. So, yeah, we both went to train. We both went to college in the 80s and credit cards were being handed out at the, the student sign up in the student mm -hmm. union and like you, I also had trouble with credit card debt uh, early on and you know the first 10 years was crazy uh, paying off just what now is a minuscule amount at 18 percent just took forever mm -hmm. you know and uh no i don't like that either and we certainly don't like it in our churches and i think one of the things we're going to find is you know through this massive unemployment that's going on with covid uh and some of the restructuring in the church and some churches closing there's going to be a lot of debt and uh you know a lot of debt budgets debt well budgets. people i think we're going to be my gut 25 35 years ago oh my gosh kevin i studied economics and i was even a teaching assistant in the graduate program in economics mm -hmm. um and i just have a sense that inflation is coming down the down the pike and maybe we'll have inflation wipe out the uh the debt but at the same time it'll just destroy the the base of my church which are retirees on fixed income because inflation is a tax on the uh, on the savers. Sure. No, it, uh, the economics of the next dozen years is going to be incredibly difficult because right now, in government in, in Washington D.C., they're saying, "How much money should we give you per child?" You know, to to help you know uh, spread this this COVID pain uh, a little thinner, and you know they're just printing money. And printing money, as we know from World War II Germany and the Versailles and all, you you go back 75, 80 years, doesn't work. And it's not going to work now either. I uh, you know that we try to grow the economy bigger than our deficits to outgrow it. But uh, we're to the point now that there's just no light at the end of the tunnel and you can't print money forever. I've been to Zimbabwe a number of times, and we have viewers in Zimbabwe, mm -hmm. and they have gone through inflation of a thousand percent a month. And I know one uh, 
one older couple, uh, retirees. They had, were white commercial white farmers with a commercial farm who were driven off their farm. They live in a little apartment in Harare now. Um, their children have moved out of Zimbabwe. They want to stay. And they had all their savings in U.S. dollars. And then the Zimbabwe government basically said, okay, we're mandatory confiscation of your U.S. dollars. We're going to give you Zimbabwe dollars at a rate of five to one or whatever it is. Yeah. And so they went from having maybe $25,000 in the bank to $250 uh, because of the Zimbabwe inflation was so horrific within a month or two. So we may think, oh, well, this happened in Weimar, Germany in the 20s. It's happening right now in Zimbabwe. It's sure. going to happen soon in other countries. And as you say, Kevin, uh, promising not to raise taxes, but then coming up with all this spending. Uh, when yeah. you print money, there are consequences. There, there are. Uh, and now this is more of a show about history and theology than economics. But, you know, George studied economics and, uh, you know, I do well on Wall Street. Um, it's something we need to talk about because part of COVID's uh, destruction is not just the virus, but what the virus is doing to our economy and to shutting us down as a, as a, a global society. Well, it's really we had our Zoom. Well, we had a parish meeting on Zoom, mm -hmm. and this was the first opportunity for a good number of our people to be in a public forum, because they're not uh, older people, uh, generations in late sixties, seventies, eighties. Not everybody is internet savvy. A few are able to Zoom with talk to their children, but this was the first mass group where people's friends were there, and we had a great, as is one in a church meeting. We went off a lot of rabbit rabbit holes. Uh, down a lot of extraneous lines, and huh? I'm pretty good at that myself. But there is a fear, an underlying fear, of political instability, fiscal instability. Mm -hmm. um, I would say my congregation, I would say, is typical of my area, which is a conservative part of the country. I would say uh, only one out of five people sees good times ahead or think their children or grandchildren will have as high as they have. And so there's a great deal of fear. And the theological aspect of this is, why is God letting this happen? Why is God's favor being withdrawn from the United States? Why? Or the globe. Or the globe. And I, uh, you know, I pray with people, I try to encourage people, but I can't print money. Uh, <laughs> I can try, but I don't think it'll be accepted at the 7-Eleven uh, no. if I try to pass it. Well, I, I think, you know, this will be opportunities for new uh, sources of uh, money. I think Bitcoin will, you know, certainly be something that takes off in the next 10 years uh, because of this and more and more companies and uh, places will be taking Bitcoin uh, because it's more of a global dollar set than a, uh, uh, something stuck in, in, US, I, in, in countries. I read, I read yesterday that Tesla will now accept Bitcoins mm -hmm. for the purchase of their, their cars. Mm -hmm. So Tesla, Elon Musk, has always been the cutting edge guy. Yeah, he so, started so. PayPal. So absolutely. Which, oh, listen, great transition. If you ever want to donate to Anglican TV, Anglican Unscripted, or Anglican Inc., you go to Anglican Inc. or Anglican.inc forward slash donate, and we have a PayPal account you can donate to. What a great transition, George. We should really move on to the news. There's a lot out there. Um, the big thing in the in the news the last year have been riots, whether it's mm. been the, the, the Black Lives Matter riots here in America, whether it's been the recent riots in D.C. Now we have a uh, takeover happening in Myanmar. And there's an Anglican angle that we need to talk about because um, it's much more difficult here in America to overthrow the government because we exist so well in three different branches. But places like Myanmar, it doesn't take but you know a, a couple crooked uh, government officials or army officials or police officials, and you got a a, a big time uh, riot on your hands, George. Most since independence from Britain in the uh, 
late in the 50s, late 40s, the majority of Burma, or as does it, now it's called Myanmar, has been ruled by military juntas, military regimes. And a few years ago, not more than 10, I don't remember the exact date, democratic rule was restored, democratic parliamentary democracy. Mm -hmm. Well, on, there were elections in November of last year, and on February 2nd, the new parliament was to be sworn in. On February 1st, the chief of staff of the army declared mar a state of emergency, martial law, and he's arrested 167 polit pol civic leaders, including the president of Burma uh, and Aung San Suu Kyi, who is the famous woman. She's a state councillor. She's not yeah. president. And on Sunday, Monday, and today, Tuesday, it's a day ahead in Burma, uh, but yesterday for them, today for us, there were massive s s protests in the streets. Uh, local news reports about 700,000 people took to the streets of Rangoon and Mandalay and were faced off with the army. Uh, in Rangoon, uh, the crowds were dispersed with water cannons, and in this administrative capital, uh, police fired rubber bullets into the crowd. Um, now, the government shut down the internet when they took Plower, but they turned it back on on, on Sunday. And so we, Burmese Americans or Burmese expatriates have been watching closely what's going on because people are, via social media are printing a live streaming riots. I mean, I the first thing I saw was somebody on the rooftop of their apartment building uh, shooting down into the streets, seeing the police marching arm in arm with water cannon in back of them, clearing the street in front of them with the cannon, just, you know, knocking people off their feet. And then the news, uh, Burmese news, started reporting with live streaming of the riots. Um, we were, I was contacted by a Burmese Anglican saying the Archbishop of Burma has called for peace, Anglican Archbishop Stephen uh, Tan Mint U, Stephen Tan Mint, yeah, he's got four names, uh, has called for uh, peace and nonviolence, and he's also asked the police uh, to protect the people, not hurt the people. Correct. Now, we originally had some doubt to be incorrect that Archbishop Stephen was identified uh, on one of these videos, but it wasn't him. We got an interesting, I got a, we got a correction from the Chancellor of the province of Myanmar. And to be perfectly fair, uh, we've got to be darn careful because this is a police state. Mm -hmm. And if I write that the the Archbishop did X, Y, and Z and he didn't, they can arrest him for that sure. and charge him with treason. Mm -hmm. But he, here's the fun, what, what I think is funny, and this is sort of a knock on American politics, the ch charge leveled against the President of Burma and Aung San Suu Kyi was that they violated health restrictions under the state's COVID lockdowns. So Governor Gavin Newsom, of Bur you can move to Burma and you can be just like the Burmese gentle, gen generals. But whatever, and we don't really know what's happening. Uh, it's, 12 hour, it's 14 hours difference in time. So when, it, when we're awake, they're asleep. But this the fear among christians who i've spoken to burmese christians in the united states is that the army is sort of the center of buddhist nationalism um and whenever the buddhist nationalists feel pressed they attack christians mm -hmm. or they attack the muslim rohingyas oh uh, because most of the christians in burma uh, are out in the outer margins and the edges uh, the uh, the kachin people along the in the borders with Thailand and Christianity uh, is has is, is governed with a heavy hand in many parts of Southeast Asia and this could be a precursor to uh, widening persecution yeah the ACNA has a couple dioceses with close relationships with uh, Myanmar and uh, have called for prayer uh, this is a very difficult uh, situation because uh, they don't hold back violence very quickly mm -hmm. in, in these states, and um, it's easier to wipe them out later and say sorry later. You know, wipe them out now and say sorry later. And uh, uh, that's 
sadly what's probably going to happen here uh, uh, without the intervention of prayer. And so we have to be careful uh, professionally, and we try to be. Um, but at the same time, we also need to plead God's blessings upon these people, as well as the people of Nigeria, of Sudan, of Pakistan, of, of the North Korea. Uganda. And China. All mm. these places, uh, mm. tens in uh, mo northern Mozambique. Right now, one of the least reported news stories in the American press is the fact that the jihadists are really having a field day in northern Mozambique around the city of Pemba and the countryside. And, you know, there's Anglicans on the ground there and their churches are being burnt and they're being, you know, there's an advantage, this is sort of a sad commentary, but because the Nigerians speak English and their newspapers are in English, we know what's happening there. I have no, I don't speak Portuguese, and I've and the, there's not a tradition of a free press in Mozambique, so we only get second, third, fourth hand from mission societies. What's happening there? Month after the fact, when they send out their newsletters. However, if you guys do know something, you wanted to us to report it, please forward to uh, Anglican TV at gmail .com, or I'm going to post George's email in the comments, and you can find our contact information on Anglican .inc because. Um, it's important we communicate what's happening around the world, especially in these violent countries where Christians are at risk. Um, I'm going to move on to Twitter. I can't think of a place in the 20th, 21st century here that is more of a cesspool of communication than Twitter. And uh, I don't have a Twitter account. We have a professional one with Anglican TV and Anglican Inc. where whatever we post on Anglican Inc. and Anglican TV is just automatically tweeted out there for people who follow us on Twitter so they get it. We don't engage in conversation. Uh, if I have ever been uh, um, uh, accused of anything on Twitter, I would never know because I never read the, the mentions or comments or ha stuff that happens on Twitter. It's a cesspool. It's not a place you need to put your opinion. It's part of the cancel culture. It's where people go to find people they hate, and then they will try to cancel you. And Twitter sucks. It, it, it's the worst of human society in the 21st century. So when I see a priest, no matter what denomination, try to express his or her opinion on Twitter, I know that there's going to be a problem. And this happened to an Anglican priest from the Church of England uh, this week who just wanted to, you know, hey, I'm going to throw something out there. Just toss it out. La, 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 la. And uh, uh, the people who agree with me will agree with me, and the haters will just hate. And guess what, George? <laughs> the guy made the news, and I think he was surprised by how much news he made. Uh, he was a nobody. He's now a somebody. That may, That's Twitter 101. Oh. There's a fellow named Gerald Robinson Brown, hyphen Robinson Brown, mm -hmm. who's a curate at a church in the Diocese of London. He's uh, of uh, African descent, I think from the West Indies. Mm -hmm. He's also gay, and he's quite vociferous about his being gay and black. And recently, a, a fellow named Sir Tom Moore, Captain Tom Moore, died. Captain Moore is was an older man who raised millions of dollars uh, for charitable work. Um, he just was an example of unblemished goodness in British culture and society, honored by everybody. Well, but he's also not from my generation or my kids' generation. He's from the greatest generation. He's World War II veteran, War II veteran. Uh, and, and was knighted before his death this past... He was knighted a year or so ago by the mm -hmm. Queen for his service to the country. A, tr a folk hero, somebody sure. that you really would emulate who people named streets after in towns. Well, Tom Moore died, and Britain sort of went into a period of, uh, not national mourning, but it was something that made the news, and people, isn't it sad? Well, Gerald Rant Robinson Brown decided to be a contrarian, and he said, all the outpouring of grief, he said this on Twitter, uh, now, after having posted for years tweets about being gay is blessed and holy, and you find the Lord in gay sex. You know, just sort of the crazy stuff. 
that we come to expect from certain sections of the Episcopal Church, nobody paid attention. He tweeted that the, the mourning around Tom Moore was a sign of the cult of white British nationalism. And Imperialist. then he had a <laughs> second tweet that was equally uh, bigoted and racist. Mm -hmm. This man is a heterophobe, not a homophobe, a heterophobe, and he is a black racist, uh, being and he is anti-patriotic. And now it's perfectly fine for this guy to say these things. I don't care one way or the other whether he says them or not. No. But he's touched a nerve. And I think that the PC culture has been so aggressive, so intolerant, so nasty. Nasty to people like from J.K. Rowling, uh, the Harry Potter author, who has defended women's sports from transgendered people. Um, Martina Navratilovna, the woman uh, tennis star, who mm -hmm. just someone, people who you wouldn't think have been canceled uh, from British culture. And I think Gerald Robinson Brown went too far. And there was a huge pushback in the press and the initial push pushback was sort of fun to watch a fellow named rod little who's a car who is a columnist for the spectator said you know the archbishop of canterbury and the bishop of london should really stand behind their man gerald robinson brown because this is the one clergyman of the church of england who has a backbone who, he says what he speak. thinks yes <laughs> so instead of one of these mush weather vane clergy that stand for nothing this is a guy who stands for something we may not like it but he stands for something his character integrity uh, i thought that was rather amusing it was because but the then response from the bishop of london was the mush you're talking about well she said then the first response was we're going to have an investigation and it was a very bad boy and he's not going to do it again and as sure as the sun rises in the morning what happened next the gay activists said, you're just being mean because he's gay. And the racist activists, meaning the Black Lives Matter and activists who despise white people, said, you just are being mean to him because he told an unwanted truth that white whiteness is evil. And the uh, end result is that, uh, you know, we're at the cycle where, and then, oh, I'm sorry, and of course, as soon, just as let the sun will set in the evening, the Bishop of London climbed down, apologizing that, oh, it's terrible that people are being racist and homophobic to this heterophobic racist, uh, Gerald Robinson Brown. Uh, you have to hand it to the, the Bishop of London. If there's any person who did a worse job in media relations it would be justin welby but she's really pushing him yeah. for the incompetence crown uh in the church of england and that's like i go back to what i said twitter in the tweet verse is a cesspool and when you're going to throw out your opinion to the cesspool don't be surprised if the cesspool you know spits back at you um, he apologized for his tweet. The apology went nowhere. And there's a reason for that. The left does not provide forgiveness in apologies. Mm -hmm. You can apologize all you want. Liberals do not accept apologies and they do not forgive. And mm -hmm. guess what? You did it in, in the tweet verse. You're not going to get an apology or and you're not going to be, you're going to get an apology, but you're not going to be forgiven. And I'm not surprised by what happened. I saw the tweet originally. I did not know that he was black or gay. Um, I didn't see a picture attached with the tweet. I just said, this guy, oh, you're going to have a bad week. Guess what? Yeah, he had a bad week. And the church is now lesser for it because you, you had to, to fight your politics on, on, on the cesspool of Twitter. Well, I, I, I don't want to read too much into this because it is a it is a 90-minute wonder 
Yeah. Everybody, he's had his 15 minutes of fame and his life will go on and we'll never hear from him again unless they make him the first black gay bishop in the Church of England. Archbishop. Archbishop. Arch, first black gay archbishop. Yeah. Um, but what this is all part of the what he's able to say is based on critical race theory mm -hmm. that there's something in the amniotic fluid of white women that makes white children inherently evil that only white people can be racist blacks can't be racist that the in other words the the marxist worldview of class struggle that was led to the deaths of tens of millions of people in the 20th century is being imported into the church uh, under this uh, critical race theory so that even in the AC and in the Episcopal Church, we've always had our kooks. And this being Black History Month, we, you know, the Episcopal Church trots them out and our institutions do these uh, uh, sort of, you know, ritual obeisance to the to the gods of wokeness. Now we're seeing it in the ACNA, where people uh, are on the ACNA Facebook groups or some uh, writers and clergy are spouting theological nonsense first off anti-christian nonsense scientific secondly nonsense scientific nonsense mm -hmm. that you know these people are are uh will be the death of some portions of the acna yeah because there's no future in wokeness i'm expecting a future response on, on the bishop level you know they handled this this gender sexual identity issue very well i would hope within before their next meeting they would be able to have a house of bishops statement on uh critical race theory uh i think critical race theory for the next generation is going to be the most destructive teaching uh within and without the church um it's going to be standard teaching within the public schools uh your schools here in america are going to be taught to hate America and any any society that has its children taught to hate it will collapse and they're going to take the and, church with it in 1999 I was in Zimbabwe I mentioned I've been to Zimbabwe several times sure. a term teaching thing and I went with some students uh, from Bishop Gold Theological College uh, to a rally uh, and there heard Robert Mugabe give a speech that uh, had the refrain kill the white man I, I was very conscious of being very pale at that point. <laughs> it was very wet. Uh -huh. And the other students were also, the students were sort of worked up, you know, repeating it too. And then one of them said, oh, George, we don't consider you white. Um, you're one of us. You're an Anglican uh, that erases their sin of being white. Um, where I'm going with this is that the, now none of these people who have since gone into the ministry and are decent, honorable folk, are racist but they people do get caught up in the political momentum of the time and one of the one of the things that is on the ascendancy is the return to racism in our culture mm -hmm. of people are judged not by the the martin luther king jr's mantra that you judge a person by the caliber of their character Con content rather, of the character content of their caliber character rather than the color of the skin that is being rejected by the schools, by the state, by universities, try, you know, by the church, by the, by the church, by business, big business. Um, you know, each major fortune 500 corporation has a whole diversity team that does nothing but uh, make sure that uh, we've got this many black, yellow, green, pink and blue uh, employees. And it doesn't do anything for the bottom line but it does employ a lot of bureaucrats and waste a great deal of money. A lot of middle management. Middle management is a great time to transfer uh, back to, uh, sorry, I got a text. That's the cool thing about our, us doing our shows using our, our, our MacBook Pros here is we can be squirreled. <gasps> oh, text. I'll read it later. Um, transition here, we're talking about middle management. One of the things that happens to a church when it gets older and older 
is it loses its focus on the gospel. It loses its message uh, with a state church like the, the, the Church of England is. It, it's lost so much in so many centuries. And somebody wrote an article calling the Church of England a relic. And I'm like, what a great opportunity just to, to close the book because I think GAFCON is the last hope for Anglicanism in the world. Because once the Church of England closes its doors, um, there's little Anglican push into the world. I think there'll be a slow collapse of it. GAFCON may be that last hope. Because the Church of England, the Mother Church, is surely a relic, if ever there was one, of what it used to be 200, 300 years ago, George. Well, there are two ways to go forward in our conversation. A, is this a bad thing? Yeah. And B, who's going to happen? <laughs> I don't think it's... Well, yes. Uh, well, let's talk about the, the article in Spectator uh, called Holy Relic, the Church of England. Uh, this week's issue, The Spectator, uh, published February 4th, had an article by a lay member of the Church of England, a woman, who talked about the church's disastrous response to the COVID environment and highlighted the fact that the Diocese of Chelmsford is going to eliminate 60 frontline clergy jobs uh, because they don't have the income coming through. Mm -hmm. And they're basically uh, going to be making decisions that this parish, that's going to make it because it's got a good geography, good demographics. These five parishes in the countryside, eh, we're going to amalgamate them or we're going to shutter them or this parish in a uh, too far away from the subway stop in the city uh, underground stop it's not going to get the traffic we need to keep it open and the 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 article authors say that this was just in a time of moral confusion of fear the same sort of fear that i talked about in my congregation is facing people in the church of england what is the future going to hold the church of england has decided that we're going to reduce the resources we're going to reduce the money spent on building the faith, but ensure that we have diversity officers, women's officers, assistant deputy to the assistant deputy of the compliance department. In other words, the the uh, is it their their the focus is on uh, preserving bureaucracy and cutting the frontline clergy. Well, the diocese of Chelmsford put out a press release saying. It is not true that we're going to cut 60 jobs. Yes, we're not going to fill 60 jobs as people retire or move away. And I'm, re I'm reminded of the old argument between Democrats and Republicans. Republicans would propose a budget with a lower rate of growth, a lower rate of increase. The Democrats call that, a that call that a tax cut. Well, no, we're increasing it. Yes, but not as fast as we want it to increase, and so you're cutting it. <laughs> So we have the Diocese of Chelmsford and the Church of England put out a statement saying, oh, this is so untrue, it's so terrible. Yes, we're going to do it, but not in the way that you think it is. Um, but yes, Kevin, your, your conclusion that the Church of England uh, is just past the tipping point, it's in a death spiral. One of our viewers, uh, a priest of the Church of England, uh, I'll just say his first name, Matthew, uh, published on Facebook that he had left the Church of England. He couldn't be part of this organization entity anymore. Mm -hmm. So there's not an organized push in England for clergy to withdraw. It's just that there are people, uh, men and women of good conscience, to say, I just can't do it anymore. So things are pretty bad. Yeah, they are bad. And, you know, the problem is, I think there's going to be such a vacuum when the Church of England, and I'm not saying if anymore, I'm seeing when the Church of England uh, collapses within within the next you know dozen years, um, there's going to be that leadership vacuum of people who always look to the Sea of Canterbury for it, its political uh, voice. You know the ability to get things done in the middle of Africa, the ability to uh, get things done in, in parts of Asia, uh, just because it had a political you know force behind it. That won't be there, and I I going to see you know. Anglicanism suffer from it. That was there under George Carey. Mm -hmm. In other words, George Carey could get involved in Rwanda, get involved in Sudan as Archbishop of Canterbury, 
um, could uh, in even Rowan Williams sure we saw could uh, could uh, uh, get Robert Mugabe to back off of the persecution of Anglicans. The Church of England under Justin Welby has totally sold out to the woke culture so that the Church of England is, you know, backs the British government's uh, like pro-gay, pro-transgender campaigns so that uh, the Church of Uganda, for instance, really says we don't want foreign aid money from the England because it comes with these strings that we have to adopt their moral standards, which we find abhorrent. We're seeing this in West Africa, Central Africa. Now, some poor countries like Burundi, yeah, 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 whatever you want us to do or say, we'll take the money because we're dying. They'll do that. But the company, countries that are doing much better, Uganda being one example, they, uh, they're not going to sell their soul for, from dollars from London or dollars from Trinity Wall Street. It's so, so the influence of the Church of England, um, Munir Nice when he was uh, uh, Munir Nice when he's uh, when he was primate, would really value the uh, intervention of Michael Nazar Ali or the, the Archbishop of Canterbury and other influential British leaders. He would value Michael Nazar Ali lead asking questions in Parliament of the British government about persecution of Christians in Egypt. Because at that time, it did something. It worked. It worked really well. I mean, Egypt was going down a bad road up until the, uh, um, what was called the Spring Awakening. Remember what that? <laughs> yeah, when, when the, um, the, the Arab Spring. Yeah. But right now, the, uh, I, I, it, it, there's no magic in any of this. When you, uh, a leader has to have when a leader is viewed as being ridiculous or is um, he has no uh, nothing behind him he's not able to get things done mm -hmm. um, and in, in British terms uh, Justin Welby is the Harold Wilson in American terms the Jimmy Carter um, I'm not talking about them as individuals their character whether they're nice or bad but as a president yeah. ineffective yeah and but this leads into my other point is that would this be a bad thing i was going to be a bit of a, a prat and say you were saying the church of england is the best at gafcon is the best hope for anglicanism i knew exactly what you're saying but there was a bit of me that is a bit of a jerk that said no jesus christ and the holy spirit is the best hope for anglicanism <laughs> well we all agree with that but you know yeah. that that would have been that would have been not not a very nice thing for me to say but I really do believe that I think out of this chaos I think is the potential for the reunification of Christendom mm -hmm. uh, in the United States we saw years ago 15 years ago Richard John Newhouse and Ch Chuck Colson uh, for, put together a group called Evangelicals and Catholics Together mm -hmm groups that historically viewed each other with severe distrust whatever the catholics want because we're evangelical we well, were against it. they would call each other the antichrist it wasn't just yeah. distrust it was <laughs> absolutely and there's a movement now where for instance the pro-life movement mm -hmm. uh is has is a very vigorous in certain portions of the catholic church and very vigorous in certain portions of the anglican church and those two pro-life groups have more in common than they do with each other on basic moral issues than they do with their fellow Catholics or Anglicans. Yeah. Now, it's when you get into specific doctrines of uh, Calvinism versus Mariology versus it, then, yeah, they're all full of parts. The full Oakley cause, yes. Yeah, I mean, there, uh, how many councils do you want to recognize all this? There are special interest groups that will always be there, will, will attempt to do derail the reunification of Christendom by pressing their own agenda. Mm -hmm. But I see the good that is coming from this destruction, out of this destruction, I think will arise a more confident, more vigorous, more spirit-filled church that does not rely upon the state or upon its history, 
but relies upon the power and the good news of Jesus Christ. One of our compatriots, we haven't had him on a while, Father, uh, what do you call him? Argo? Oh, Argo. Yes. <laughs> I was going to say Nardo. Uh, <laughs> no, Argo. Father Argo, who works in the Middle East, um, has reported again and again about the movement of Christ across that region that would put the evangelistic efforts of the Church of England and the Episcopal Church to shame the number of people coming to Christ. And in the Episcopal Church, the problem is, oh, the kids have soccer practice month, Sunday morning, we can't become Christians then. Where the problem in parts of the Middle East and Africa, well, if you become a Christian, we'll kill you. They're growing. We're, we're declining. And I think it's this, and the spirit is growing not because Episcopalians are doing better or Pentecostals or Catholics or this or that are doing better, but Christians are growing and people coming to a faith in Jesus Christ. And then they sort of, you know, flow into whichever uh, worship structure is best for them. But I truly believe that good is going to come from all this stuff. No, I truly I, hope. I hope. No, Let no, me say I hope. Kevin agrees with you wholeheartedly. I always look in my study of, of, of church history is the actions of the laity. When the laity is involved, the church really moves. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's not that sometimes the church loses its, its message. Sometimes the church loses its spark. Sometimes the church uh, it grows comfortable when it's not persecuted. But just watch for the laity. What are the laity doing? And when the laity are being activated by the clergy, by the Holy Spirit, and, and by the gospel itself, then you see the movements of the church. And I suspect, and I'm probably right, again, maybe for once, we'll see what Mrs. Coulson says, uh, I may be right here that we're going to see a, a, a wonderful movement and reawakening of the church post-COVID. You know, we had an opportunity here to wake up and say we were too comfortable. It was too easy to close our churches. It was too easy to say, yeah, we just don't need to meet anymore for a while. It was too easy to say that, George. I know some of our viewers are sick of my talking about my church. Um, but being in Hooterville, Florida, where there were no native Episcopalians, mm -hmm. there are no country clubs around here, uh, People come to my church because they f are fed by the word and empowered by the community and the spirit. Oh, and you're Episcopalian too. That's nice. That's yes, nice. I, maybe it's because that is my experience, but I see that as the future. Mm -hmm. Not people who are tribal Episcopalians, we've always been Episcopalians, will always be Episcopalians. I don't see that as the future. I see the uh, desire to have an encounter with the holy um, be being the driving force and that's why I think and, uh, there's a wonderful podcast by a friend of this show and his name just the Australian fellow Kevin what's his name the video guy well we got David Old uh, we got Peter Old does something we have uh, uh, Dominic Steele does something. Do Dominic Steele. Okay, Dominic right, Steele. That's I'm, it, sorry. That's I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> sorry. Dominic Steele, uh, and I encourage people to watch his podcast. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's more pastorally oriented than ours is. Uh, where he had he had someone on who was talking about that this whole church approach to reaching the unchurched is completely backwards and screwy, because it's not that the church is collapsing. It's just that people are describing the same thing differently and so it's the same needs that were there 100 years ago 50 years ago 25 years ago are still there but the church is responding to vocabulary not to the workings of the spirit that's how i interpreted what sure. he was saying no but i i really am i think that the dominic Steele's uh, guest rory something uh was on to something we will put a link in the show notes <laughs> to make up for our <clears throat> Our forgetfulness yeah i mean and but that that's true the church is always slow to adapt to the age they usually adapt by saying let's adopt the age mm -hmm. you know yeah you know, instead of being uh, uh 
of the world and in the world. They just we'll we'll do both. We can do both, and you can't. And what happens? The Bishop of London is an example. Of being a bishop in the world of the world, oh, but not for the world. Yeah, indeed. Well, George, we have uh, what I'm checking. In. Sadly, my bifocals don't go up that high. Okay, we're we're 45 minutes in, George. Let's have mercy on our audience and uh, uh, cut this episode. Let me double check what we talked about. Everything we want to talk about. Miramar can, tweets. Can I answer? Can I respond to some questions that have been placed on the comments? Oh, absolutely. That's that's section four of our show uh kevin did remind you that this is the year 2021 <laughs> not 2020 and i think it must be a psychological uh thing where i'd rather be back in february 2020 than february 2021 uh and sort of redo the year 2020 so yes i i'm aware it's 2021 i'm sorry yeah. uh, i had an interesting uh experience this week I signed notary papers over Zoom. Yeah, I How mean, do you do that? <laughs> well, uh, there's a company that will do be a notary over Zoom. They have to watch you sign the paper. You send it to them. They stamp it. They send you a copy of the stamp, and then they e they mail you a copy of the stamp later. But it's uh, sent to you in a PDF certificate form, so it acts as a legal notary. And uh, I'm like, well, times are changing. I don't have to go down to, uh, and meet Lucy down here at the bank to get my, my notaries done. I can have all my business stuff taken care of uh, virtually now. So uh, being held in Connecticut to run my business, no, I'm, I'm on the road permanently. And we just recently changed our address to a virtual address to get our mail. So times are changing, George. They are changing. Oh, now, friends, I'm going to break a long one of the ongoing yearly rituals of Anglican Unscripted is George making fun of Ashes to Go. <laughs> it's a tie. Every, it time. every Ash Wednesday, we get these little news stories of these people at church stations and this and that, but uh, excuse me, bus stations, railroads, standing by the roadside intersections, dressed up in their, in their vestments, you know, sticking their finger into the people's cars to anoint heads and off they go. This year we're going to do that. I'm sorry. Yeah. We're having drive up ashes. We I got a whole box of these wooden Q-tips. You know the wood little inch ones with a little tip. And so I and the deacon are going to stand on the passenger and the driver's side and stick my art the Q-tip in and do your head. So heaven forgive me. I'm sorry. No, I I'm have going to ten... do our version of Ashes to Go. I have ten years. A video of you complaining about ashes to go. I'm going to make a greatest hit album and get pictures of your recent one. That's, you know, we you and I have talked about this before. I think of all the things that the Episcopal Church has done wrong, visually in the world. This is kind of the, my 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 least complaint. Now, for clergy and those who really, you know, understand exactly what Ash Wednesday is about, of course, this is horrible, but. <laughs> watching what the Episcopal Church has done the last two generations, I'm like, yeah, but they've done so much worse <laughs> than Ashes to Go. Oh, mm. George. Well, it's been a great show. This has been episode 644. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And it's still episode 644 of Anglican Unscripted.